you know, own businesses are driving without gas. I know that many of you may be working from home, not working at all, struggling to keep your businesses afloat or helping others to do so, and likely juggling any number of responsibilities. I sincerely hope that you and your loved ones remain well, and thank you for taking the time under these difficult circumstances. My name's Abigail Golden Vasquez, and I'm the founding executive director of the Aspen Institute Latinos in Society program. Our mission is to identify, promote, and catalyze ideas and solutions that foster greater opportunity for American Latinos, enabling a more prosperous and inclusive America for all. Though Small Business Week is officially canceled, we felt it was more important than ever to recognize the outsized contributions made by small businesses, and particularly Latino owned businesses to understand the ways that COVID-19 is impacting large swaths of Latino and other emerging majority businesses that form the backbone of our economy. Our expert panelists will explore both the challenges and opportunities that this black swan event has unleashed. Prior to COVID-19, Latinx owned businesses were the darlings of the economic recovery, leading in new business creation at twice the rate of other groups, while non-Hispanic white-owned business creation was in a prolonged decline. Latino entrepreneurs account for one in four U.S. businesses, contributing more than 300 billion to the economy annually, despite very real challenges they face in accessing capital for growth. This outsized new business opportunity led, the Latino, led by Latino entrepreneurs contrasted with the low growth in the size of their businesses a mere 3% of Latino owned businesses reach a million or more in revenue, led us to create the Forum on Latino Business Growth, a group of cross-sector, multi-ethnic business ecosystem leaders committed to coming up with solutions to accelerate the number of scaled Latino owned businesses. While Latinos in society in the forum remain committed to scaling, we're well aware that the new reality means we must center our work around the survival and recovery of these businesses first and foremost. Our panelists today will address what they're experiencing from their unique positions on the front lines of this crisis while recognizing that while the coronavirus was the spark that exposed longstanding inequalities for all to see, it also presents an unparalleled opportunity to build back better. Before passing on to my co-host and collaborator and dear friend, Mark Madrid, CEO of the Latino Business Action Network at Stanford, I have a few brief announcements to share. Please note that you will be muted during this Zoom call. However, you may engage during this session using the icons found at the bottom of your screen. To ask a question, use the Q&A function. Our team will share useful links and resources throughout through the chat function. This is also where you may comment on the conversation or ping our AV team with, to help troubleshoot any technical difficulties you may have. I also invite you to engage with us on social media throughout the program, tweeting at Aspen Latinos and using the hashtag Latinos Advance. Now over to you, Mark. Thank you, Abigail. We are immensely grateful for this impactful partnership with the Aspen Institute Latinos in Society program. And thank you everyone for investing precious time during these unprecedented times to be with us. Uh, my name is Mark Madrid, CEO of LBAN, Latino Business Action Network, and we collaborate with Stanford University to champion the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative. Thank you for being here. We consider this topic an American economic imperative. And in brief, I'll just start with the data to support this argument in this position. We fund the most powerful research coming out of Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative on US Latino and Latina entrepreneurs across 50 states in Puerto Rico. And the last report coming out of Stanford called the State of Latino Entrepreneurship cited that over the last 10 years, the number of Latino business owners grew 34%, 34% positive growth as compared to everyone else in terms of business owners, which was 1%. Also in a 2018 report, the state of Latino entrepreneurship was exposed an immense $1.47 trillion opportunity gap. And I'm going to repeat that, $1.47 trillion, which represents a difference between what Latino and non-Latino business owners earn. So it was an, a problem then, and it is dominated and you know, triggered even more so during this COVID, COVID environment. 
Most recently, the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative surveyed mostly scale firms, and we defined scale as over a million dollars of annual gross revenues. And it was a simple question asked at the end of March. If shelter in place persisted, how what runway would you have? Only 23% of mostly scaled firms responded that they would have a runway, runway weight past a year. Only 23% reported that they would be in operation over a year. So we can't think of a more important um, inflection point than to have this topic today. And we're hoping not only to connect with your mind, but to connect with your heart. Now it is time to get the conversation going. And it is my honor to introduce a dear friend, Javier Sade, who is venture partner at Fenway Summer and former associate administrator of the Small Business Administration, the SBA. He is a man who not only connects with this issue from the mind, but with the heart. Javier, thanks for facilitating this conversation. Thank you, Mark, for the kind words. Thank you, Abigail. Aspen Institute, Stanford's Latino Business Action Network. It is my pleasure to introduce this incredible panel. So let's get going. Lisa Mensa, CEO of the Opportunity Finance Network. Marla Bilonic, Executive Director of the Latino Economic Development Count, um, Center, excuse me and Perla Rodriguez, CEO of Bowler Strategic Advisors. Welcome to the four of you. Let's get right to it. Oh, a little bit of hygiene. Um, we're not going into bios, so if anybody needs to see bios, um, they're, uh, they're easy to, uh, the, all of us are easy to find. So the way we, get, we structured the conversation was that we're gonna talk about the macros, kind of at between 30 and 15,000 feet. Then we're going to go into the impact on Latino-owned businesses, and we're going to close it up with, so what, now what? So it has been already established, and we're all living through it, that the economy and the world economy specifically was dealt a massive blow. Those groups that were underrepresented and underserved were dealt an even bigger blow. So what we're going through now is not necessarily new. It's just been magnified. And the hard won ground that Latinos and Latino owned businesses have gained in America over the last four decades is at the risk of being lost in just the span of two quarters, as you heard before. So to all of you, um, and I'll start with Lisa, how do we stem and mitigate the issue of not losing this ground and where can entrepreneurs turn for to, to stay afloat? Yeah. Thanks, Javier, and such a pleasure to be here with you and the group. Uh, you said it, this crisis just magnified some of the issues which were here. And I'm on this panel because I represent a network of nearly 300 community development financial institutions. So you'll hear me talk about the CDFI industry. All of those are mission lenders who are investing and were investing before this crisis in low income and underserved communities. You take us as a group, and if you look at the borrowers that are part of my network, we are there for, our borrowers are 85% low income, 58% Latinos or people of color, and 48% women. And so we've been there in this economy trying to lend. And what this macro view, I believe, shows us is that we need the lenders who have been on the forefront of crises before, who were there in the fight even before there was COVID. The CDFIs, we should think of lenders as on your side. We're a $185 billion industry. And it's an industry that already had $19 billion of lending to small businesses. We're not gonna move out of this macro challenge if we don't get our lenders to the small business, the money, the gas that the businesses need to drive to, to get moving as well. And so part of how uh, this macro picture presents to us is who's out there on your side as a business to make sure you make it. 
And we're a part of that ecosystem, we CDFI. So let me pause there and... Marla, your perspective on this? Agree with Lisa. Uh, we, the Latino Economic Development Center, is a community development financial institution, and we are a member of OFN as well. Full disclaimer. Um, but I do agree. You know, we're the folks that are on the ground. We are the folks that have the trusted and existing relationships with community members, and it's only natural that we would be able to serve them, um, you know, in an effective and caring way. Um, and I think that you know has been somewhat overlooked in the programming that's been put out in terms of um, federal and local assistance. We'll get to the federal and local programming pretty yeah. soon. <laughs> Perla, your perspective, you're on the ground every day. What do you think can be done and where can entrepreneurs turn like right now? Well, I think uh, jumping on this conversation about CDFIs, I have to say I, as a Latina entrepreneur in the heart of the Silicon Valley, I haven't been connected to one. Um, and through this crisis, I've really come to see uh, the challenges of not diversifying even how I bank, you know, my approach, the relationships that I have. Um, and I think it's a huge and tough lesson learned for me um, to see what else is out there and definitely uh, connect with organizations who align with my mission, right, of supporting Latino-owned uh, organizations, women, people of color. So number one, I think we need to create more awareness about these institutions that frankly, I myself feel um, I, I've been, uh, I didn't know, I didn't know better. And now that I'm looking for financial support, um, I've been relying on big banks, commercial banks that I've had relationships with, you know, for many, many years, and they're not responding. So I think we do need to continue to create awareness, uh, we need to diversify, um, and we need to learn more. And for me, I think my greatest piece of advice for other entrepreneurs is that we have to get connected to other organizations um, like Elban. For me, El Elban has been my lifeline. Uh, the network of other Latino entrepreneurs who are sharing their, their, not only their challenges, but their strategies for surviving this. I've been able to lean and listen to other folks about how they're getting through this. Um, and the Elban staff has provided information and support so that I haven't felt lost. I may be, you know, uh, worried. I may be uh, dealing with challenges, but I feel supported. And I think that every Latino entrepreneur needs to find that support network. That would be my greatest piece of advice. Thanks, Perla. And that optimism is the kind of thing that's going to get us out of this uh, situation. Because at the end of the day, um, a lot of what we're going through, um, what's going to get us through it is, uh, is what we feel and what our attitude is. But let's talk a little bit about this uh, massive stimulus that the federal government rightfully put their shoulder behind. I think the tally now is up to $7 trillion, depending on how you count it. Half of that is gonna be borrowed or printed this quarter, um, meaning um, we're gonna print the money this quarter. Of that 7 trillion, about 10%, 700 billion, that's a big amount of money, was set aside for small businesses. Yet you all have touched on different aspects of this issue of um, the structural need is not matched to the solution. And that could be because banks are not equipped to provide with millions of loans in the span of a few weeks. And typically those loans are very small. So um, Lisa, I'm gonna go back to you on this issue of, you know, you got CDFIs, you got banks, you got fintech companies, you got grant making organizations. It's a pretty complicated kind of machinery uh, that supports entrepreneurs in America, specifically entrepreneurs of color. Um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, the CDFI view of, you know, this, uh, these programs and what role specifically um, in this kind of backdrop of what we're going through now are CDFIs playing? I love the question because you're really saying for all the entrepreneurs out there and for this major challenge, who was on first? Where were we? Uh, you know, how did we combat this? And here's what I know. You know, we had a traditional financial ecosystem that often missed the smallest businesses 
But you know who didn't miss them? The community lenders like CDFIs who were always there in the first place. You know, when we came together at Aspen and we put out our capital landscape, we said that there were businesses that were rabbits, zebras, gracelas, you know, we said that there's a scale to businesses and who was best equipped to reach those? The CDFIs that I represent were always making loans at the bottom, at the smallest businesses. It didn't always matter what your FICO score was or we could adjust. And so we found ourselves in this crisis often being the first responders. I've said that CDFIs have functioned like this in other crises where we were the financial first responders. We leaned in before there was even a federal response. What was troubling then is that the first federal response, which was carried through traditional lenders, kept missing all the people that were always left out in the first place. The 700 million, the first tranche, largely missed CDFIs like Marla's LEDC because they weren't baked into the landscape. So I feel like the public response saw the crisis hitting our small businesses first. Obviously there was a health emergency, but right after that, when you shut down the economy, those small businesses were vulnerable. And by going through lenders that did not have relationships like the ones Carla's talking about, we missed. And so, and unfortunately we were fighting to get into eligibility. And I think that was a huge mistake. We should not have been left on the sidelines. The, you know, it's better, we've, we've come along, but um, first thing, see the issue, use the people who are in. Somebody told me, you CDFIs are the capillaries of the blood system for getting money out. I love that, but you know, <laughs> we gotta use the capillaries if we're gonna get to the full body. And I think that's why we saw such a kind of frustrated first response with businesses running around trying to get to these resources and knocking on doors and knocking on doors. And when the CDFIs were allowed to play, they did so you know, over a billion dollars of PPP loans, but we were, we were entering the, the playing field quite hampered. And so that's the disappointing thing. That's what we got to fix. We've got to be part of the response. Um, our economy is a very complicated machine. Yeah. And when something like this happens, you know, there's a, one can say that there's some analogies to 2008 but 2008 is probably uh, an inappropriate analogy because the that crisis was born out of excess risk and leverage in the financial system, which trickled out. This has been literally simultaneous halt to the entire economy. So I'm going to go over to you, Perla. You deal with, you yourself are a small business, but you're dealing with small businesses every day. Um, what, um, what are small businesses telling you um, real time, you know, the ones that have had success with gathering some of these funds, the ones that have not, like what, you know, what, what are the experiences right now on the front lines? Perla? Perla, you're muted. Can you hear me? So sorry. Yes. You know, in being part of the LBAN network, I've been able to hear about the many stories of uh, experiences that people are having. I think that a number of organizations um, are still looking and searching for resources. Uh, many of us have not received PPP funds, um, have not received SBA funds. And so we're Within the LBAN network, we've been able to continuously meet, have support groups, um, and develop strategies internally uh, to develop. I think we're having a little bit of a streaming issue, Perla, with uh, with you. So I'm going to come back to you okay. and, and a few. Mar Marla, I'm moving over to you. I mean, your your CDFI is focused directly with. Um, with Latino-owned businesses, mm -hmm. that's the focus of our discussion. Just what's your what's your view at the at, at the ground level, not the forest, but the weeds? Yeah, I mean, the one thing that I'll say is just what we're seeing, and it's you know echoed in, in the comments that Lisa made and, and Perla as well, is that 
this is really a race to access and our clients, you know, when else has there been a time that every single business in the entire United States has been impacted by a shock like this? You know, there have been natural disasters, there have been, you know, man-made disasters like 9-11, um, but it's extremely rare to have sort of literally every single business clamoring for, you know, and competing for the same resources. And so, um, you know, much like is mirrored in, in the systemic failures of um, society, you know, we're seeing this trickle down to the um, access to financial resources. And so, um, you know, we, as Lisa said, really struggled because when these um, federal programs came live, we as CDFI industry really struggled to be able to provide the finance financing. A, because we, there was, you know, without getting into a long story, there was a lack of clarity around who was actually activated to provide these loans within the CDFI industry. And then once we were activated, liquidity is a challenge. You know, we are not multi-billion dollar funds like a bank um, that's a depository institution. So in order to meet the demand, you know, I'll just give you a sense, like when we opened up PPP, we had over 300 applications in two days. We typically process 200 loans a year. So like it, you know, it, it's just um, the demand is so high. Our businesses are really struggling. We serve a lot of businesses in the food industry, which of course are one of the hardest hit, um, you know, and people are worried. People are worried about their own next meal. They're worried about their employees um, that they've either had to lay off or furlough. Um, you know, I won't lie, it's not pretty. Carla, I think uh, you look like, uh, like your, your, your streaming capability uh, got a little better. Um, uh, I want you to finish your, your thought about the um, about the the view you're having at the at the ground level with the uh, uh, with the entrepreneurs and the small businesses uh, specifically today. Um, I'll share a story that I heard from our Elban you know network, um, and we had you know employers entrepreneurs who were really struggling with having to lay off a lot of people really quickly, um, and really grasping sort of the emotional aspect of it. Um, and also recognizing that they had to make some very tough decisions if they were going to survive. And so I have to say that right now people are really looking, you know, to make important decisions for their survival. Um, and that's what's happening right now. Every day people are determining whether they're going to continue with a particular product line or service, whether they're going to have to scale down to be, sometimes you have to slow down, right, to, to move fast. And I think a lot of us are thinking that way. We might have to slow it down a little bit to be able to go back and run. But if we don't make that decision, we may never get up again. And so that I think is the, the feeling that we have to make some changes. We have to adapt quickly. We can't wait. Um, and if we do that, we will survive. And then once again, we will thrive, but we have to make these decisions. And we've been supporting one another um, so that we can get through it and recognize that sometimes that's what leadership calls for. So that, that's really the tone of what's happening uh, down on the ground. Um, you're touching on uh, kind of peripherally or tangentially uh, on something that uh, I think Latinos as a group and including small businesses have not been good at, which is dispensing and communicating their power, their collective power. Um, I think we've start, we're, we're starting to realize that power. Um, when the sausage is made in the, in the hill and bills are passed, typically the, the, the input that small businesses have on these kind of bills and the, you know, business, small businesses are half of the, they employ half of the economy. Two out of three net new jobs are created by small businesses. It is literally everybody's business, small businesses. And it is collectively the biggest business. Yet, um, interestingly, very fragmented when it comes uh, to speaking with a, uh, with a collective voice. So I'm gonna switch it a little bit. I mean, you guys all will have perspective on this. Um, if, you, if you look at what happened with the first slug of the money, the $350 billion, about something between three and 4% went to uh, businesses owned by people of color, which means that a smaller amount went to Latinos. It's 
dismal to put it mildly, but sadly explainable, right? Let's say you had the ear, and I'm gonna start with Marla on this one. You had the ear of Jovita, Carranza, the SDA, or Steve Mnuchin, um, or our president in the Oval Office. What would you, what would you tell them? Uh, how would you um, verbalize and characterize the importance of Latino-owned businesses, the vast majority of which are small? And how would you tell them to have pursued uh, these, uh, these relief programs? Sure, so um, if I had their ear, I would tell them, um, you know, I would try to emphasize the importance of the job creation that happens through Latino owned business. Your run of the mill job creation characterizer to employ. So, um, you know, recent immigrants, uh, youth, single moms, um, you know, the restaurant industry is, is notorious for, for, in a good way, for employing, you know, these harder to reach um, employees. And, you know, that would, you know, I think for good or bad, small business is usually sold through jobs. So that would be sort of my angle is the jobs angle. Um, in addition, I would also, not only because it's self-serving, but also because I believe it to be the most effective way to reach Latino-owned and other minority-owned businesses, is to use CDFIs. Um, I was lucky to participate in the forum that we had in Aspen in June of last year. And out of that, in a previous forum that I know you participated in, um, a playbook was published. And um, play number two is around having commercial banks more effectively use CDFIs. Um, to reach those communities that they typically don't reach or are not physically in. Um, and I think that's really missing here is the, the use of, of CDFIs. Um, you know, we were a lucky recipient of a, a fund from a local bank to be able to do PPP lending. And it, you know, has been such a great partnership because we are reaching people that they would never be able to reach and that they want to reach. Um, you know, and that's really what CDFIs are here for. We're here to reach, um, you know, in the, the corners that banks really aren't able to access. And so I would really, really emphasize that, um, particularly to Jovita. Lisa, I'm sure you have all kinds of perspectives on, on, yeah. on this, um, on this kind of rethinking, you know, what better opportunity, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And I don't say that lightly. Um, just your perspective on this. Obviously, there's a there's a friction between a little bit of a healthy friction, and now it's a little bit unhealthy between banks and CDFIs. What you're sitting in front of Jovita and Steve Mnuchin, you got three minutes with them. What do you tell them? Okay, I hope I follow Marla because she already <laughs> did the hard job. She convinced them that there's no choice. This is the American economy, and the the we've got to fix this. And I would start by saying use the capital providers that are CDFIs. Don't exclude us, use us, don't exclude us. You know us, you've known us. We've had a CDFI fund in treasury for 25 years. We've been SBA approved lenders, use us. Don't exclude us. We are part of the system. We wanna lean in. If we get a chance, we will do you proud. So first off, use us. The second thing I would say is let's fill up the gas at the CDFI as well. You know, we've got to go big now. This is a moment when these kind of lenders who are specialized need to play in a big way. And I don't just mean in, you know, uh, May of 2020. I want our network to be there for all of 2020, 2021, as we push these businesses like Perla out into the recovery. So if I have the ear of Jovita and Steven Mnuchin and our president, I would say it is time. You've known this industry for over 30 years. Help us do an emergency appropriation now to shore up the Marlas, the LEDCs. The, we need a, we, we're asking for a billion dollar uh, emergency appropriation to the CDFIs. It's a thousand member, it's a thousand uh, institution network. So, but don't just stop there. Make sure that we've got the gas to keep 
funding to keep moving. That was why it was important for us to have liquidity through the Federal Reserve. You know, use this network. It is so, it's tested, its losses are, are minor. You're gonna get the public-private partnership you have always wanted if you double down on our network now and really use us, we're in place. You know, this is not the time for starving the group that is best positioned to lend strongly and to support. We're not only lenders, we're also the group that's gonna help network, help what Perla was saying, you know, sometimes the solutions are not just financial. And that's the, the plus you get with the CDFI. You get Marla's talent around connecting you to other resources and this is the moment and you know i think we're a great bet i don't think we're that expensive i think we're in place we're local this is not some federalized solution cdfis have grown up in and from the communities so that's my play and i hope they're listening i think they want to achieve more for this country it's it's just too important mark madrid's stat that we've left a trillion dollars, a trillion four out of our economy by not pushing our Latino owned businesses forward. To me, that's a stunning stat. We've got to move this group forward and we wanna be partners. You're both hit on uh, something that um, I was very focused on when I was um, uh, in the last administration, which is that the argument that underrepresented groups through advocacy and different things uh, usually make to the public sector center on social justice. But the gas we're talking about, capital, the gas for the engine, is about business, yeah. right? So, uh, and I think we've been really good as a, as a group in starting to make that case with data about the imperative of small businesses, uh, Latino entrepreneurs, African-American entrepreneurs, and how they are pathways to success. And that America is, last time I checked, about 30% white male. So America looks a lot like this group looks like here, uh, heavy female, heavy brown and black. So Perla, let's talk a little bit about um, some of this, uh, some of these issues because um, you know we're living in a reality, right? Like we just exposed a little bit of the what if situation, but now we're in a reality. The switches are being turned on at different states. Some businesses have already failed. Many more are likely to fail, but some are going to be ready to go. What are you? What are you telling? Uh, what are you telling those small businesses uh, um, as they um, as they continue to sort of to navigate this? Um, as I think about this situation in this pandemic, and I'm hearing about you know assistance programs. For me, it's about kicking down the doors of opportunity. Um, and, you know, how do we get more corporations, how do we get the federal government, local, state government to work with diverse uh, companies, right? How do we get access to opportunity? Uh, we're not necessarily needing a loan, we need opportunity. And so I, I, as I, you know, work through this challenge and thinking, how do I work on that um, in terms of accessing new opportunity, not the the stuff that I'm continuing to do, but how do I keep pushing open those, you know, how do we push open those doors and how do we work with groups like Elban and others, right, um, to, to make that demand? Because it's not just about accessing loans and capital, it's also about just the opportunity to compete. And I think that we need to do more in that space if we're ever going to get beyond this, because we're not looking for a handout, we're looking for the opportunity to do what we do. Um, and I think that's something that we need to think about also as a Latino community and as Latino entrepreneurs. Um, the move to digital uh, will continue to, to move. And obviously um, everybody's concerned that big tech may amass more power because everybody's moving online. Yet small businesses, some of them have been pretty agile and you know, using 
uh, using digital constructs to deliver food and all of these, um, all of these different um, technology driven things kind of click and mortar. I'm not talking about tech companies. I'm talking about sort of existing businesses. Um, I, I have a, and this is to whoever wants to answer. Um, um, in this move to digital and Latinos are by far the youngest demographic, I think our median age is 27, that of the general population is 41. Um, we're gonna be a hundred million strong uh, in 20 years. Right now we're about 60 million. Um, is there something here that uh, will hasten a move to a more digital society specifically for Latino? Anyone that wants to take that? I think the fact that we're having an Aspen event on the Zoom call is <laughs> the proof of what you've said, Javier. And there's no question that some of the growth that we see moving these businesses to the scale, uh, the Latino owned businesses to the scale is a digital. I, I think it is undeniable that businesses need to move there. And, you know, now we've had this experience where even service businesses are using digital platforms to uh, reach deeper with their customers. So, and I'm sure Perla has that experience too. I just wanna take this question in one other way too, which is to show who's listening and, uh, and learning from this crisis. You know, we have had an outstanding outreach from Google in this crisis. And I think that some of our most successful big global companies are listening and repositioning in this crisis and trying to be relevant and meaningful, you know. So we just announced a Grow With Google Small Business uh, Fund uh, that I don't know that we would be there. I mean, it might've taken us five more years to say that that's a partnership. And I think that partly out of this horrible pandemic, some bright lights are happening that even some of our most successful global digital companies are leaning in and looking for new partnerships. And we've been the lucky partners uh, you know, with Google. Go to our website, go to Google's website, say grow with Google, you'll be pointed to OFN. Uh, and I think it's a, an example that they too understand, the Googles, the Facebooks, the MasterCards, the, you know, that they understand the digitization and the, the tech side of our economy and want to be part of it and have values that say everybody's got to get in. There isn't really an option, you know, uh, just like 20 years ago, everybody didn't have a website. Now you can have a very simple business and you still need a website. So. Uh, I think um, I think a couple of things have been happening because of this, and we will be forever changed. And I just I did want to say that I think there's some new partnerships that are also possible because of this. We'll get to silver linings in a in a second, and I think that's kind of what you're hitting on. Can you talk a little bit about the application process and who is eligible for um, for the Google Small Business Fund? It's actually one of the questions from the from the audience, which I'll start interspersing uh, for the remainder of the discussion. So a little bit more to the yeah, people listening a, about how to- It's a really new process. We have not opened up uh, the, uh, all we've taken is uh, uh, there is a major loan partnership and we've had uh, right on our website, OFN.org. You can go now if you are a CDFI and a member of OFN and you wanna be a lender with the uh, Grow With Google Fund, you got to come in there. It's not a business to business fund. So this is a this is support from Google to the CDFI industry. So if you're a small business, you got to go to the CDFI. And that too is found on the OFN website. Uh, the grant process, which is also to CDFIs, will open later. Um, but the uh, letter of interest is right on our website. So go ahead and that's there now. So stay tuned. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Going to Marla, uh, there are a couple uh, couple interesting questions that come in uh, for you. Um, they, and, uh, you struck a, a partnership with a commercial bank. Um, mm -hmm. 
Um, can you explain a little bit how those work in your case? I know a lot of CDFIs, fintech companies uh, are doing some of these partnerships. Can you describe a little bit what that looks like? Absolutely. Well, in this case, it was really um, the meeting of our need with their capital. So um, I would almost view it as like an advance on the capital that we would need to be able to have the liquidity to do the PPP lending that I spoke about earlier. And so, um, you know, we have our limited loan fund that is also taken up by some of our active borrowers. We have around 300 active borrowers right now. Um, and so we had the means and the capacity to do the PPP loans, but we didn't have liquid capital available to make those loans. And so we partnered, I'm you know, happy to say it was a PNC bank um, gave us a million dollars um, in a loan, but a low interest rate 0.75% loan to be able to, um, you know, quickly put these loans out um, to our clients and to the people who were asking for this product from us. And so you know, really without that um, and other, you know, folks who stepped up, um, the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders um, had developed a fund um, for one purpose and they've kind of repurposed it in the short term for giving liquidity to members of this loan fund um, to do PPP lending. So, you know, it's been really about like finding these different ways. Um, you know, I think both a blessing and a curse has been like, without being this scrappy and creative, we wouldn't be able to do it. So I think um, in a perfect world, it would have been like, you know, a very easy, seamless um, transition from our traditional lending to delivering some of these assistance programs. We've had to beg, borrow and steal literally <laughs> to be able to make it happen, but we're so happy that we can because the demand is so high. Thank you, Marla. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna go over to Perla, another question from, uh, from the listeners of this, uh, of this Zoom call. Um, it, an interesting discussion, and it's about, um, um, is there anything out there to teach and or uh, explain how to set up a website, kind of online basics 101 uh, to small businesses? You advise small businesses, I'm sure this is part of the the structure, what do you advise uh, to small businesses looking to, you know, website in a box kind of stuff? Well, I think that there are lots of, this is a great, almost commercial, right? Uh, there are lots of great Latino owned firms that do communications, website mm -hmm. work. We're gonna have to make some investments as organizations if we're gonna get through this, right? And so take the time to do your research, look at what Latino uh, organizations, businesses are out there doing this work um, and make the investment. I think this is the time to think about what we truly need and what are those investments that are gonna propel us forward. And so um, my answer to that is there is a wealth of companies out there, Latino owned, Latina owned uh, companies that do this kind of work, including my own. And so. Take the time to make some investments. All of us are gonna to have to make investments in changing. Um, and those investments are gonna help us be more effective in the long run. So again, back to my analogy of having to slow down to, to run, we need to think about what those critical investments are. And the companies are out there. We're all out there uh, doing this important work. Thanks, Carla. Um, over to Lisa, another question from the from this great audience. Um, the question is, it's a, good, it's a good one. Is there a clearinghouse somewhere where a Latino business, or I guess any business, can go to see what options they have for financing uh, based on their size, their location, uh, so on and so forth? I think the answer to that is there's no one central place. That's what Alas. makes it so difficult, but, um, um, just maybe some markers on that, Lisa. Well, I would I would start with a local CDFI. Somebody you can go on our website. We have a CDFI locator because what you find, and we're all sitting in our living rooms right now, but um, what you find are people who are not just you know 800 numbers somewhere in you know another country. They are going to eventually get back to you and say you know how can we help. And I think what CDFIs are good at doing is if, if, if you're not a fit for their financing, you know, they specialize more in housing or facilities and you're a small business, they tend to be the kind of glue that knows where those funds are in, uh, in your community. So 
And because it's so localized, you know, some of our CDFIs are just the smartest, you know, locally embedded. They know what the mayors are putting together. They know what local bank consortiums are putting together, or they were like Marla, they're part of it, you know. Um, I'm gonna encourage folks to try a partnership. You know, I love Perla's recommendation to be part of networks like Alban has created. But for a quick, I don't, there isn't one clearinghouse, uh, and, but in this digitized world, it won't take too many clicks before you can at least see who's offering lending and other services in your area. And I would encourage folks, because sometimes, you know, it, this does vary by locality. You know, there are programs available in some states and cities that aren't um, matched everywhere. It's not, you know, people access the federal funding in different ways. So I would really be mindful of that. And remember, that there's a, we're in a crisis moment now. So there's a need for the gas of the moment. And then I think there'll be a need for the gas of the journey. And I think both things uh, could be an appropriate moment for a Latino own business to connect with a CFI space, you know, uh, to, to look for both kinds of gas. Makes sense. Um, so I'll, I'll answer it a little bit from my own vantage point. I invest in fintech companies and uh, some well-known ones are Square, PayPal, Intuit. Um, there are a few in our own portfolio that are making partnerships with banks. Um, those are not necessarily geographically constrained. There are a lot of small businesses that don't have the relationships or don't have uh, the capacity for, uh, for banking uh, situations, probably use Square to take payments. Um, and some of those uh, organizations are actually uh, doing a lot of the uh, a lot of similar work to that what CDFIs are doing, yet they're not geographically as geographically uh, uh, constrained or connected to a particular community. So that would be um, uh, one more um, kind of one more marker. Um, I'm, let me read through the let me read through the um, through the questions here. Um, I'm gonna uh, kind of a jump ball here. Um, interesting question about the roles of chambers of commerce. Uh, most people know the US Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, but there are you know, local chambers of commerce. Some of them are local, uh, specifically to cities, states, Latino focused. Um, how, uh, how are they involved in this and, and how, uh, how do you engage them and what's their role? Whoever wants to take that uh, uh, question, go for it. I can shout out some props because um, I think the chambers have weighed in at this big moment and been some of the strongest political voices advocating for the needs of Latino-owned businesses, Black-owned businesses. I'm very proud. None of us have enough juice on our own just to keep making that message. And I think the chambers were early in getting in there and making the case to you know, leaders at the top level. Chambers have often been the place I mean, we're a financing network. Chambers have made, in America, have been the connectors and uh, to do the kind of things that uh, Perla has been mentioning, you know, and, and I think they've been changing, you know, I don't run a chamber, I run a network of financing players, but I think the advent of Hispanic chambers, of black chambers, is also partly in recognition that often traditional changes didn't give the kind of networking enough. So, I'm proud that there has been an expansion of those. And my sense is that we would not have had uh, some of the quick actions we saw the government take had not these players weighed in. I mean, this was Marla's early point. All of a sudden, every business was hit. So this wasn't just a small business or a very the rabbit-sized businesses of under a million in revenue. This was everybody at once got a shock the system. So this is one moment where I think even the broader set of allies that may be on a different agenda on other days, man, this was a good moment for being unified and for kind of breaking through. And I hope that that stays together for the recovery because uh, when it comes, we're going to need those voices to say, we got to finish the job. It is not done if just those businesses that had over a million and two million and three million in revenues come back. We got to have 
uh, the rest of the economy come back. Uh, the interesting dynamics between what a bodega in Washington Heights mm -hmm. looks like to a business that may have 250 employees, um, a big pillar of a community that is Latino owned and they have different needs, but they were all hit at the same time. Um, I think I wanna take one last question and then hand it back over to, uh, uh, back to Abigail and Mark. Um, you know, in terms of policy, uh, just looking, looking forward, right? We've learned that the economy was much more vulnerable than we thought, right? The fact that we literally had to inject so much money so quickly kind of was the economy on fire or were we running on fumes? I'm not sure. Um, uh, the wealth disparity, right? The educational, it's kind of a big question and I want to close it big. Um, educational, you know, pathways to access to that. Um, wealth creation in our communities being erased at incredible uh, speed. Um, from a policy standpoint, where, where would you focus the hill going forward, right? This happened, it put a magnifying glass on things that existed. Where should we, where should we focus on? I can take a stab real quick, um, if that's helpful. Um, and I think the angle that I would take would be around the drastic disparities that are occurring from an income perspective in the United States. I think we're turning into, you know, for lack of a better term, like a third world country where they're the very, very richest of the rich who are like mega billionaires and then, you know, people who are struggling to find their next meal. And so I think, um, you know, I'm not calling for socialism, but I think we need to really examine the systems that have put us in this situation where we, um, you know, have such drastic and vast disparities. Um, you know, I think exactly what you said, you know, when we, um, in our area here in the Washington DC area had, you know, our first week of, of stay at home and closures, um, in that first week, 25% of our portfolio reached out to us for leniency on their loan. So I would agree, to you, would agree with you that like everyone's kind of teetering on the edge there. It wasn't like everybody had some sort of a buffer to deal with this kind of scenario. And I think that was just a microcosm of the entire economy that, you know, everyone's kind of teetering. Um, and this push, you know, is what has pushed us over the edge. So that would be, you know, my angle and I'll hand it to my other panelists to give theirs. If I, if I could jump in, I, I think policy around this access to opportunity, how much money does the federal government spend uh, for services and goods? Um, where is that spend being made? And is there opportunity, again, for minority owned businesses, women owned businesses and other important groups to have a piece of that pie? Uh, I think policy around the opportunity to compete uh, I think that is important, and I, I'd love to see more being done there. If we can solve that issue, um, you know, we won't have as huge a need for capital because we're playing in that space, and we have to kick the doors down. And I think that sound policy around that would be, you know, life changing um, for Latino entrepreneurs. The biggest buyer of things and services is the federal government. They spend half a trillion dollars. We should have a bite of the apple. Lisa, one, a few last words before we hand it yeah. back to Aspen and Stanford. I love the question because it really is your now what question. And where would this hill focus? Well, like you, have yeah, I had a chance to serve before. And the hill needs to focus where they've always focused. We have a beautiful, powerful government that already has a budget, you know, already has departments that could be focused stronger. They need to pour the gas in the right directions. You know, when I was at the Department of Agriculture, we have powerful titles to fix the broadband, to support the businesses, to support the critical infrastructure. You know, we've seen what SBA can do. SBA has done more loans now under this PPP program than, you know, typically they would do in years. So use those agencies and fund them wisely to reach down deep into the economy. And finally, 
our beloved Treasury Department. I think this crisis has shown that they've got to believe in the groups that they know are partnered with the financial sector. And I think this is the moment where the Hill should say, we don't move forward out of this crisis without a serious army of partner lenders. And that's our CDFI field, our field of, uh, of, of lenders who want to do this. So, you know, every year of this administration, we started with a zero in the budget from the administration. Now, Congress didn't do that. Congress added it back, but that's what we need. The now what? We need serious budgets dedicated to the kind of things we already know work. These are leveraged, proven opportunities. So for me, the now what is take it seriously, use the budgets that you've got. Now with a lens to, I like the Perla's thing, with a lens to opportunity. We're actually act, not asking for a bunch of new programs. We're saying fund what exists in a serious way to unlock opportunity. And uh, I really hope that's where we're headed. Budget, budgets are policy for sure. And yes, this is not about new programs or expanding government or anything like that, regardless of the money we're printing. This is about funding priorities and the way that's done is through a budget. Abigail, Mark, back to you. And thank you panelists for your perspectives, your time, and to the listeners, thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa, great. Perla, Marla, for your words of wisdom and Javier for your extraordinary moderation. Um, and thanks to the audience for your excellent questions. We had more than 250 people registered and others who joined along the way. So great to have you for this important conversation. I also want to thank uh, the Aspen Institute AV team for making this possible and Ben Eiler specifically. And of course, my own small but mighty team, Maria Samaniego, Lara Kinney, and Francisco Perez, Jada. Um, before signing off, I want to share that we've included in the chat a link to our playbook for scaling Latino-owned businesses, um, which has, has several uh, plays that are specifically relevant to this crisis that we're facing right now, particularly a play, the play that Marla talked about on how to improve the way that commercial banks work with CDFIs and a market play on leveraging tools and technology to access global marketplaces and a high growth play focused on technology to enable internal and external Latino owned businesses to improve their operations. Um, just a last note here, while this crisis is catastrophic for huge swaths of the country, we cannot afford to miss this once in a lifetime opportunity to build better systems and structures that offer more equitable access to opportunity and that would foster an economy that works better for everyone. So with that, uh, one final note, please, uh, there'll be a short survey at the conclusion of this event. It's really helpful to us to get your feedback. Thank you so much. And to everyone, be safe and be well. And thank you to Mark Madrid and Elban for your partnership at, as always. Um, it's a delight to work with you. Thank you. <laughs>